Thanks. Um, so today we're going to be talking about um, uh, the, the differentiation of inverse functions. Inverse functions. So again, this is this is something that uh, is going to increase our repertory. Um, you know, funk. Last time um, we uh, talked about the differentiation of um, uh, some more of the exponential function, and we also talked about differentiation of compositions. Right? Differenti of comp differentiation of compositions was a really uh, useful, you know, powerful tool. Right? No matter now, no matter what we have. You know, if we can compose, a, if you have a function that's a composition of a lot of functions, uh, we know how to do it, and pretty simply. Right? And so now um, we'll be talking about what happens if we apply inversion to any of those functions, and we'll be able to do that too. So this basically you know, doubles our, our repertory. Okay. So um, uh, just recall uh, uh, what inverse functions are like. Um, You have uh, you have one function, so you have one function going from one set to another set, right? It takes in some input and spits out and spits out an output, right? That's what a function is. Um, and for some functions, it's possible to go uh, back from the output back to the input. Okay, so um, right, so for some functions, there's there's a function that that goes from the output back uh, takes you does the reverse and, and reverses the effect of the first function. So a simple example, um, f of x is 2x, right? So there's a function that multiplies by 2, right? Then you have this other function, g of y, uh, that says g of y is 1 half y, right? And this re uh, reverses the effect, right? It takes, takes in something and then returns you half of that. Right? And you see that um, g of f of x, right? if we take the composition, what happens? We get g of g of 2x, right? So g takes in that thing and then takes half of that, right? one half of 2x, it gives you back x. <coughs> so g reverses, right? When you apply them in succession, then nothing happens at all, right? And in the reverse order, right? Um, f of g of y, right? Well, g of y, we get f of 1 half y, right? And f of 1 half y is twice 1 half y, and it gives us y back, right? And so we see that if you apply them in, 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 in either order, then they, they, can, they cancel each other's effects off, right? Okay, so um, I think you've seen this sort of thing before. But just to uh, just to review, let me give a couple more examples. Um, so first is say um, uh, f of x is three x minus five, right? So this function um, right takes in takes in an input and says, okay, I'm going to triple it, and then I'm going to subtract five from that. I'm going to triple it and then subtract five from that. So what's the what's the inverse function I'm going to do? What would the inverse function? How would you get back if somebody gave you something that had been tripled and subtracted five from? How would you return to the original? Think about it for for 15 seconds and then and then just think about it like logically. If somebody triples something and adds, subtracts five from it, how do you get back to the original? Right. Well, you would take your thing, and then what would you do with it? Um, add five, and then divide by three. Right. You'd add five, and then divide by three to get back to get back to the original. Um, right. Yes. Well, 
Yeah, yeah, it does. But uh, think about think about somebody. Suppose somebody gives you something, and secretly <laughs> it's three of something minus five. Okay, and they say, get, we'd like you to get back. We have this thing. Um, we have this thing. They give you this thing. We call it y. Okay, and they say, we'd like you to get back to um, to the original. We'd like you to get back to the original x. Right. Well, how would you do it? You would say, well, I've got to add 5 back on, right? I've got to get f add 5 back on, and then I've got to divide that whole thing by 3, right? And if I do that, then I'll get back to x, okay. right? So you, you, you can see that's what you would have to do. That's what you'd have to do on a break. Right? You'd have to add 5 back on to whatever you've got, right? Somebody hands you something and says, give me, give me, get me back to x, please, right? And you say, well, um, uh, I, well, to reverse this, I've got to add 5 back on, and then I've got to divide the whole thing by 3. I can't just divide the y. If you divide the y by 3 first, right, so say, well, maybe I'll divide by y, by y first, and then I'll subtract 5. What would that give me? That would give me uh, 3x minus 5 or 3 over minus 5. Right, that doesn't get that doesn't get you back to x, right? And so this is the I think this is probably how you were taught this thing here. Um, maybe one way how you were taught to uh, taught to figure out the inverse functions, right? You said um, sometimes they'll say, well, uh, how to solve for the inverse function? You you take your function and set it equal to y, right? And then solve for x, right? Solve for x, right? So you, you start off with this 3x minus 5 plus 1, and then you solve for x, and you end up with, um, uh, as you see, you end up with x equals y plus 5 over 3, right? And then whatever, whatever is on the right side, then uh, this thing on the right side, uh, the right hand side is f, in, uh, f inverse of y. Right? And that's so that's that's your that's your inverse function over there. Right? Right? Because if f of x is y, then x x is gonna be f inverse of y. Yeah, Rachel. Is that how you want us to, to find them? That's that's a way to do it. Yeah. Okay, because and you don't care if like the variables are just around because the way I was taught how to do it was you set it equal to y, but then you switch x and y, and then you solve for y again. Yeah, which what's is the, the switch? Same what's, thing. what's the switch for? Um, just because it's because we're used to solving for y instead of x. The switch is the switch is because people like to think of functions in terms of x. I think, right? Uh, you, most of the time when you think of a function, you think uh, f of x. Right, you don't, you, have, you actually have a prejudice against y, or a prejudice for x, if you want to say it more nicely. Um, right, get rid of your prejudice against y. Okay. Um, it actually, uh, in, once you get to um, higher higher level classes, you have different variables, and, and each variable will count for something different. Right, and uh, uh, it actually makes more sense to think of right if your f is a function of x and gives you some y value then f inverse really should be a function of y and give you some x value, right? So that's actually more logical. Or to make it more, uh, more dramatic, um, if you have some function f and it goes to like some position on a donut, right? right? So here's so f is x and here's f of x, right? Which is some position in space, right? If I talk about f inverse, if I talk about f inverse of x, it really doesn't make sense at all, right? Because f inverse should be a function of a position on the donut, right? It shouldn't be a function. f inverse is not a function of, of the real line, right? So um, one really ought to use a different, different, uh, different uh, variable for the out for the input of the inverse function because it could be going to completely different space. So yeah, so that that is actually um, the switching of the. You might at that time have wondered why, what's a switch? You know, why do we need to do the switch? Um, and the reason is that uh, they're just uh, uh, sort of catering to your um, 
a preference for X. But, but now, get, please get rid of it. Thank you. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Um, okay. So let me have you do a few one uh, for practice. Uh, after that, uh, actually, in my notes, I've written everything in terms of X, so I myself am guilty of this prejudice. Uh, but uh, on the board, I'll try to write it uh, without that. So here, here's uh, f of x, um, y minus x cubed, 1 over 5 uh, plus 2. And I'd like you to solve for the inverse. This should take you, I don't know, like 20 seconds. On the right hand side, sorry, the right hand side. What's up, Ruchika? You look unhappy. What are you unhappy about? <coughs> just like to find the derivative for this. Like, I was just thinking you would have to use. We're not finding the derivative. We're finding the inverse function. Right, for the inverse, you would have to basically like do the inverse of chain rule, right? That's to find that. Hold on. Hold on for, hold on for one minute, and oh, well. Okay, turn to somebody else and, and say what you got. Tell me what you what you ended up with. Uh, what's what's the inverse function? Would somebody like to tell me what the inverse function is? Uh, Helen. Um, the cube root of the fifth root of y minus two plus one. Is that right? Let me, let's work it out. Okay. Uh, yeah, okay. Oh, I was just going to say that. What, what did you get? Um, the cube root of negative uh, parentheses y minus 2 to the fifth plus yeah. 1. Yeah, that's, that's what I mean. So, but let's, let's work it out to, to make sure. So let's solve for x. Well, what do we do? Um, first thing, this is subtract 2. Right? And then let's take the, uh, oh, yeah. This is this is the fifth, right? Sorry. Um, uh, then we take the fifth power. Right? We get one minus two to the fifth. Right? We subtract one from both sides. Right? Um, or we move it. Let's switch sides for everything. So one minus this equals x cubed, and then you take the cube root of that. is equal to is is your is your inverse function. Can you Rachel? Can you um, take the one out because the cube root of one is one or not because they're added? So you're thinking maybe that the cube root of a plus b is the cube root of a plus the cube root of b. That's right. right. Is that true? We can we can think of it like what about the square root? Is the square root of one plus one is the square root of one plus the square root? Of one plus the square root? Is the square root of 2 the same thing as the square root of 1 plus the square root of 1? Okay. 
So, so for some functions, so for, for some functions you can you can do that. So fu for some functions you can, uh, you know, you can you can either add first and then do it, or you can do it and then and, and then add. Uh, some functions this is called uh, commuting with with addition. Some functions commute with addition, but but not this not this function. Uh, Emily. Um, I didn't switch the signs with the negative x cubed because um, this cube root of negative x cubed is negative x, right? There's no switching of some. Um, yeah, well, so. Okay. Subtracted one right there. Uh -huh. you, yeah, switch. You so I, I moved this guy to that side, I moved this guy to this side. That's what I did. Right, if you don't do that um, and I got negative x cubed equals. Um, yeah. That's fine. So it looks yeah. totally different though, because I got x equals negative cube root uh, one. It's the same thing. It's the same thing. It's the same. So you get negative x cube equals one minus two to the fifth minus one. Yeah. Right. So you get um, uh, then you get say uh, so you took the cube root there, and you got negative x. Yeah. And you got this is the cube root. Cube root of that, mm -hmm. uh, and then you got a minus on that. Okay. Right, you got a minus sign on it. But that's actually the, that's actually the same thing, because okay. the cube root of um, although the, the although the cube root doesn't commute with the um, uh, yeah. it doesn't commute with addition, you can actually say that the cube. Uh, Negative one, negative one, one minus two, one minus one to the one third. It's actually the same thing as negative one to the one third, y minus two to the fifth minus one to the one third. Right? Yeah. That's true because ne this negative, this negative sign is the same thing as negative one mm -hmm. to the one third. Right? And you, uh, uh, this function actually does commute with multiplication, so you can. So you can bring the negative one inside. So you get this, Oops. which is the same side. Okay. So it is the same thing. Okay. Rachel. Yeah. Okay. Any anybody else? Okay. Okay. So. Um, Okay, so inverse functions. So a, a, a brief, uh, hopefully, a, a brief um, reminder of what, what they were. Um, uh, one one last thing, uh, non-example. Um, f of x equals x squared, right, on the real line. For this function, right, going from the real line to the real line, it doesn't have it doesn't have an inverse function, right? If I say the output is one, what was the input? No, it was negative one. <laughs> right? Or like, you see, if I if I tell you the output, it's not you can't you can't tell me you can make some guess, but you can't tell me exactly what the what the input. You could say, well, it might have been one, it might have been one, and it might have been negative one, but you don't, you don't know which one it was, right? So there's no way of, of, of there's no way of getting back to the, there's no set way of getting back to the original, right? Um, okay, so this is an example. Given the output, one can't return to the input. Okay. Um, however. Uh, However, um, uh, if we look at f of x equals x squared on zero infinity, right, suppose we say uh, the inputs are all positive numbers, and then I say um, the output is one. Can you get me back to the input? Sure, right? Because then uh, the domain is restricted, and uh, and there's no there's no ambiguity. In Right, the picture is like this. Right? Originally, we were looking at, the, at this function, right? And for every for every output, 
there were two possible inputs, right? For every output, there were two, for every y, there were two possible, there were two possible x's, right? Which x was it, right? But if we restrict the domain to, to just half of the original domain, the, where the, we restrict the domain so that the function uh, has only one, one input for every output, then, then it's okay, right? Then that, that function is invertible. The, the, this function, which wasn't invertible, if we restrict the domain, then it becomes invertible. Okay. Okay. Um, so that's uh, okay. So let me um, let me put up the, the definition of the invertible function. Um, F from uh, S to T is all invertible if there exists a function G going from T back to S um, such that F composed with G uh, doesn't do anything and G composed with F also doesn't do anything right, for all and for all S and S. In which case, one calls G of S, the inverse of F. Does that, does that make sense? Right? If f takes x to y, then f inverse takes y to x. Right? So if this point is on, on f's graph, then this point is on f inverse's graph, and vice versa. Is that, is that, does that make sense, logically? Yes? OK. So what does that say? Uh, thus, the graphs of f and f inverse are reflections of each other across the line y of x. Right? Um, for example, so here's the line y equals x. So just now we were looking at the uh, the x squared function, right? Um, x squared, and we know that the um, the inverse function is going to be the reflection of that. It's the square root function, which is the reflect whose graph is the reflection of the square function, 
uh, across the line y plus x. These functions are these functions are indices. Okay, and uh, if we had looked at the reflection of the full uh, function f of x equals x squared, what would we have gotten? We would have gotten this and this, right? So this is the graph of f of x equals x squared, and this is this thing here would be the graph of of its inverse. And you see that there is no there is no inverse function because this doesn't describe a function. Right? Although if we restricted it to the right half, we get we get this function here. And that's, that's invertible. And if we restrict it to the left half, would that be OK? Would that be OK? That'd be OK too, right? Uh, if we restrict it to the left half, uh, that'd be OK. We get this function. What's this function? Negative square root of x. Negative square root of x, right? right? Right. Because if somebody gave us a value, then the original thing would be the negative. You, you take the square root and then take the negative of that. Right? And that would get, that would get us home again. Right? If I said, I've restricted my domain to the negative numbers, and my uh, my output is one. Then you know that the that the input must have been negative one. Okay. Just some terminology, which I think you might have seen before. Um, these one-to-one -one functions that, that are the invertible ones. So one-to-one, -one, what does one-to-one -one mean? That you never have anything like this, right? You never have two different values, s1 and s2, and the same, the same output. Okay. So you never have sort of one never as, as this sort of thing, right? One never has two different values ending up at the same point. And that, that basically tells you that if you're given the output, you can get back to the input. Right. Right. So um, uh, if f is 1 to 1, uh, it has an inverse. of all outputs of f, right? Set of all outputs of f back, back, to the, back to the domain. Taylor, do you have a question? Oh, no, I was just I gonna ask, it's the inverse of f. Goes um, from the... Goes I, I am I a, image. That's an abbreviation for image. Image of okay. <laughs> Thank yeah. you. Yeah, I guess I haven't used it before. Yeah, image of. Okay. Um. So, for example, um. Uh, 
let's say f is an increasing, a strictly increasing function. Right. Let's say f is strictly increasing. Is that function one to one? Is that function one to one? Yeah. Right. You're never going to have, if it's strictly increasing, you're never going to have two points with the same value, with the same output value. Right? Because the point, uh, if you have two different points, one will be on the left. And since it's strictly increasing, that tells you the one on the left is less than the one on the right. right? So you're never going to have, no matter what two points you have, they're never going to have the same, same output value. Okay? So if, so if, if f is strictly increasing, then that guarantees that it's one to one. And that guarantees that, that this function has an inverse from its image back to its domain. Okay. So for example, if we look at the exponential function, right, the exponential function is a strictly increasing function. E of the x is a strictly increasing function, and so we know that it has Right? It has some uh, right? It has some inverse function. Right? Some of you know what that inverse function is. What is it? The natural log. Right? The natural log is the inverse of the exponential function. Right? at some point. What can you say about uh, the inverse function? Can you say anything about the inverse function? Turn to somebody next to you and say, see if you can say one thing about the inverse function. Function. You have only one fact about the about this function, right? You know that at x, this point here, um, the limit is the value. Right? That's what you know. That at this point here, the limit of your function is is the value of f at x. Okay. What can you say about f at x? Uh, f inverse. F inverse. Albert. Uh, Alfred. 
It's going to be continuous at f of inverse of that? It's going to be continuous at f of inverse of that. Right. Will be. Wait. No. <laughs> will be continuous at f of inverse of that. Other. other F of x inverse? F of x inverse? You're going away. Inverse of y? Inverse of y? No, just no. <laughs> Anyone, anyone, anyone care to dare, dare something? Uh, Rachel? It will be continuous at inverse f of f of x. Inverse. I don't know how to say it, but like F negative 1. F negative 1? Of F of X. Anybody else? Okay. So, right. So here, here is this, this thing, right? Then the inverse function is going to, the graph of the inverse function is the reflection of that, right? The graph of the inverse function is the reflection of that. What's the, what are the coordinates of this point? X, X of X, right? What are the coordinates of this point? F of X, X, right? Okay. So here's the inverse function. Here's the, here's the original function, right? So F inverse is continuous at F of X, right? So. It'll be continuous at f of x. Okay. So it'll, be, it'll, be, it'll also be continuous, but at the, the appropriate point. Okay. Um, uh, second question, saying f is differentiable. Say anything about, or can you say anything? It's about it. Maybe you can't say anything. Is it the same? Is it invertible also? Oh, yeah, sorry. So um, F is uh, invertible. And let's say it's differentiable. Like, no, let's say it's differentiable. Well, it's differentiable at x, it's continuous at x. What do you, what do you think? <coughs> Remember, differentiability means that your function is well approximable by well approximated by a tangent line, right? So you sort of think that yeah, if it's differentiable here, if the if the original function is well approximated by a tangent line here, then its reflection is going to be approximated by by the by the reflection of that line. Yeah, Emily. Could it ever be undefined? Could the line be undefined? Yeah. Uh, let's see. If um, there's not, because I don't want to be one to one. Well, if the, if the right, 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 good enough. Although I'll, I'll talk to you for a little bit afterwards if you if you stick around. Um, okay, so so maybe so uh, what can you say about f inverse? F inverse is differentiable. Okay. Seems like this I guess. At, at is differentiable at at where? At what? At the right? And it's gonna be we found out where it, where it should be differentiable, right? At f of x. Um, and uh, with what derivative there? What do you think the 
derivative should, what should the derivative be there? Tell me. X. X? Mm. Remember what the derivative is, it's the slope of the tangent line, right? X is, X is the input point, right? The derivative here, what's the derivative here? Well, it's f prime. Right. Rachel? Would it be the inverse of the derivative of f? So the first, like, yeah. When you say the inverse, what do you mean, like? I mean, like, I don't know how you would write it. <laughs> um, like, you would find f prime of x, and then you take the inverse of f, find the inverse function. Mm, so no, no. But but if you, uh, Emily. Well, then actually I don't know. But okay, Chan, do you have some guess? Would it be? I mean, for some it would be perpendicular. <coughs> well, no. I'm not, I'm not perpendicular, right? Yeah. Oh, I was thinking at x, like so x is a line. Okay. Right. They're not perpendicular, but what do you see about them? Picture is bad, but what do you see about them? Are they reciprocals? They're reciprocals of each other, exactly. Yes. They're reciprocals of each other. Great. Should, I should give you a point for that one. Good. Okay, so um, let me. They're reciprocals of each other. So for example, um, and uh, so th right now all we're doing is sort of like uh, not really precise, but just what we think it's gonna ha what's gonna happen, and we'll I'll see we'll, we'll we'll see how to get it exactly in a second. But just to give you an example first, right? Um, uh, Well, actually, let, let me let me explain how to get it first. So, um, uh, so here's the theorem: if f is differentiable at x, then f inverse is differentiable at f of x with f inverse prime at f of x being one over Okay, and here's how one sees it. You say, well, look, I'm going to look at the composition of these functions. Okay, f inverse of f, f of x, these guys cancel each other out, and you get x again. Right? Now I'm going to differentiate both signs. So I hit both sides with the, with the derivative operator. What happens when you differentiate x? You get 1. What happens when you differentiate this thing, this composition? You get by the chain rule. Right? You use the chain rule on it, so you get what? The outside guy's derivative at f of x times the derivative of the inside guy. Right? right? By the chain rule. Right? And so what do you see? That these 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 slopes are, are reciprocal to each other. The end. Okay? Simple. Right? If you wrote it in the opposite direction, you get a slightly different fact. But sometimes it's useful phrased in the opposite direction. So you get f prime at f inverse of x uh, times f inverse prime of x equals 1. This is the, this is the same fact, but just phrased in the opposite direction. 
So that's, that's, that second fact is, is useful because you have this nice expression for you have this nice expression for the derivative of the inverse. Right? The derivative of the inverse of x is 1 over the derivative of f evaluated at, at the inverse point. These, these, these two statements are basically the same thing, but just phrased, phrased differently. Yeah, Rachel? Can you make the prime symbols and the ones a little more, like down, well, down here in the bottom, the last little, like, is that a negative one or is that a Sorry, there's a dot there. There was a period from the previous slide. Okay. okay, so for example, if, um, if I look at the exponential function composed with the logarithm function, right, nothing happens if I compose them together. If I differentiate this composition, I get that the derivative of the exponential die evaluated at the log times the derivative of the log equals 1. Okay. Maybe I'll write it with dx. But the, ex the derivative of the exponential function is the exponential function. Right? And so I end up with the exponential function of the log times the derivative of the log equals 1. Well, what's the exponential function of the log? x again. right? So you get x times d dx natural log of x is equal to 1. And that tells us that the derivative of the natural log is 1 of x. A useful, useful formula. Okay. okay. Let me just say one thing quickly. Sorry. Uh, uh, that business with um, uh, restricting the domain will come in handy when we start talking about sign. When we start talking about inverse trigonometric functions, right? Because trigonometric functions, if we look at the sign. Right, so if we look at the sine function, uh, these are very much not not one-to-one -one functions. Right? They, for every for every in, for every output, there's an infinite number of inputs that would work. Right? So what one does is uh, to restrict the domain. For the sine, for example, you restrict it uh, between negative a half pi and a half pi. So negative pi over two, to pi over two. Right? And in that domain, in that domain, the sine function is invertible. And so one can talk. One can talk about the, the inverse, the inverse sine function. Okay. So for trigonometric functions, one plate, you know, they're not inherently invertible, but if you restrict the domain, then they're invertible. Okay. That's it for today.